hello everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. So today I'll be talking about um, shared and decentralized sequencer architecture. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. So I'm a software developer currently working at Astria. Um, I've worked on blockchain uh, protocol level development for five or so years. So yeah, um, cool. I'm gonna go like pretty fast because I have a lot of content. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask questions if there's time at the end. So yeah, so first I'm just gonna talk about background. So um, what is rollups and that kind of thing. Um, sequencer design, uh, usage, like how it would be used in a rollup, um, cross rollup composability and MEV, kind of tied together, um, bridging and then inclusion. Okay, cool. So first of all, who knows what a rollup is? Okay, that's pretty good, I guess. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so yeah, so I'm just gonna define it as a subset of the L1 data that's defined by a state transition function over this subset. So I, essentially, you post your data to an L1, and then you have your rollup node, which contains the rollup state transition function, and then that rollup node reads the data from the L1, executes uh, based off that data. So that is all. I will not mention any sort of optimistic or ZK rollup stuff here because that is not relevant currently. Um, so yeah, so what's a sequencer? So who knows what a sequencer is? Okay, that's a, more for some reason? Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, so the sequencer uh, essentially is responsible for batching, ordering, um, posting, and committing the transactions in a rollup block to the L1. Um, so, so yeah, you can kind of see from the diagram, like all the transactions for the kind of go into the sequencer, um, and then it batches and commits them, posts them to L1, and then the rollup nodes execute off of that. So yeah, so as such, the sequencer is implicated in censorship, um, as it's in charge of uh, what rollup transactions are included, and also MEV, as it's in charge of the ordering of the transactions. Okay, so yeah, I can make this basically a diagram of before. Yeah, so the user just sends the transaction, somehow the transaction ends up at the sequencer, and then the sequencer sequences it and ends up in a rollup block. Okay, so yeah, so currently what do sequencers kind of look like? So the top left is what sequencers kind of look like right now. So you have your centralized sequencer, that's basically just one entity running, um, and it's also non-shared, so you just have one rollup running per sequencer. So um, yeah, so it's not shared with any other rollups. So then you can also have like a centralized and shared sequencer where it's also just one entity, but it can support multiple rollups posting data to it or sending data to it to be sequenced. And then you have uh, decentralized as well. So then this is basically a sequencer that has more than one entity creating rollup blocks. Um, and then similarly, it can be um, non-shared or shared. So yeah, so what we're kind of moving towards now is instead of the top left is moving towards the bottom right where we have um, a sequencer that's decentralized and then also can be shared by multiple rollups. Okay, so why do we want to decentralize? So yeah, one thing is censorship resistance. So basically if you have multiple sequencer entities then um, they can, yeah, they won't be able to exclude transactions as easily. Um, and then, yeah, and then also with multiple proposers, you have less centralization of MEV extraction because multiple uh, proposers can now take part in the ordering. Um, and then why share? So one thing that's been like highly touted, I guess, is cross rollup composability. So the idea that if you have a shared sequencer um, and multiple rollups are using it, you can easily bridge and swap tokens and transfer whatever data um, between the rollups. Um, yeah, because currently to do that, you would have to like go back down to the L1 and then like bridge up to the other rollup, which is a lot more steps than if it just went directly through the sequencer. Um, but yeah, this has like some caveats, which I will talk about later. Um, and then also another benefit of sharing is that new rollups can have a decentralized sequencer by default. So um, yeah, so essentially if you're launching a new rollup, you don't have to worry about your sequencer infrastructure. You can just like launch on this existing uh, shared sequencer. Okay, so some alternatives. Um, so yeah, there's definitely been debate on Twitter as to whether uh, we like uh, decentralized sequences or not. So I'll talk about some of the alternatives. So first one is based rollups where it's sequenced, uh, the rollups block is sequenced by the L1 itself. This is cool, um, except, uh, yeah, one of the drawbacks of this is that the rollup block time will be limited by the L1 block time. Um, and if we want our rollups to run faster, we can't really use that. Um, so yeah. And then also this doesn't really exist right now as far as I know. 
And then second is the escape hatch. So this is um, regarding like censorship resistance. So basically, if you're being censored by a centralized sequencer, you can force your transaction through by posting to the L1. This is like OK, I guess, but you probably don't want to be forced to do that. Um, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I don't know how to do that. I don't know, like, uh, yeah, if random users will be able to do that. And it's just you don't really have any of the economic benefits of using the sequencer in that case. And then the last one is like a centralized sequencer controlled by governance. So um, like say you have a centralized sequencer, but then it is evil, then you can just swap it out with like a governance vote or something like that. Um, this is like, okay, except then you still have a centralized sequencer, so it can still do whatever in terms of like ordering um, and MEV. And then uh, if the sequencer is um, bad, then you have to have like a whole vote and kick it out, which takes time and governance is hard and et cetera. So yeah, so I think having a decentralized sequencer by default is nicer. Okay, so, so yeah, some of the architectural design. So yeah, some of the design considerations that we want for our decentralized sequencer is um, liveness. So it has to create, keep creating rollup blocks um, and not go down. Uh, censorship resistance, like I mentioned, um, data availability, so it needs to somehow make the rollup block data available. Um, and then ideally we have like faster than L1 block time and confirmations, so nice UX. So yeah, so the main thing that we need to do to decentralize is basically just have multiple parties um, do the creation of rollup blocks, so the batching and ordering and committing, and then also becoming one of these parties should be permissionless. Um, so yeah, so what that kind of points to is having some sort of staking-based selection mechanism um, where parties can stake and then become a rollup sequencer node. Um, yeah, you can also do like infinite uh, sequencer uh, proposer sets where you have like something like, I don't know, like proof of work or like staking like without like a limited set, but that gets like pretty complicated pretty fast. And we also don't really want uh, forks, which I will talk about. So you need something more constrained like a single leader election kind of mechanism. Okay, so yeah, and another thing is like having faster block time and confirmations. So um, I think sequencers currently ex already do this, like centralized ones. So you basically, the sequencer will send like fast commitments, um, which rollup nodes can then use to tell the user um, that their transaction has been included in like X rollup block without having to wait for the L1. So yeah, so we kind of want that. So we want the sequencers to run like pretty fast and not be constrained by running like a bajillion things at once. So ideally we'd want to have like a minimal state machine um, and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, one thing I think I forgot to mention is that, so currently rollup sequencers do, um, they do batching and ordering, but they also do execution of the rollup block and then post the state route to the L1 as well. Um, not just the data. So the execution, if you have like a shared sequencer, is like going to be like heavy because you're gonna have like a bunch of rollup state machines embedded in the sequencer, and then also how you're gonna get those state machines on there. Like, can someone just like post their new state machine to it and then just like overload it? Um, so yeah, another thing that I'm gonna mention is kind of having. Uh, let me see, was there a diagram for this? Uh, Okay, whatever. Yeah, so another thing I'm gonna mention is, um, yeah, so you probably want lazy execution if you're gonna have a shared sequencer because, um, yeah, like I mentioned, if you have your sequencer uh, also executing and posting state routes and it's also shared, then you are gonna have like potentially a lot of different roll of state machines on the sequencer and it has to execute that for every single block. Um, yeah, just like the state will get too heavy, you won't be able to have fast, um, like fast rollup block creation. Um, yeah, so yeah, so the kind of the solution to this is to have the sequencer just do like the batching, ordering, and committing, and not have it do any rollup execution. So the way this will work is that the user submits their transaction for the rollup. Uh, to the sequencer, um, there can be other rollup transactions as well. So then to the sequencer, this data just looks like um, just opaque bytes, like it doesn't care about the rollup format or the transaction format at all. Um, it, the sequencer makes the data avail available, and then the rollup full nodes will uh, just get whatever subset of these transactions that they need, and then execute them um, essentially lazily. So they execute it when it's time for them to execute it. So yeah, and the user will then read the state off the full node based on that. Okay, so how will rollups use this? 
Yeah, so, so in the design I just mentioned, roll-up execution is completely separate from the sequencing anyways, um, and actually is like already with how roll-ups exist. Um, or, I don't know, it technically is, even though it's right now not, but technically you can separate these things out. So this is basically fine. Um, you would basically just need the roll-up nodes to uh, read its data from however the shared sequencer is making the data available. So whether that's posing to an L1 or posing to its own, uh, posing to a dedicated DA layer or like having its own DA layer, whatever that is, um, but that might change. Um, and then yeah, and then rollups don't need to modify their transaction format. So this is pretty nice. Um, so just hopefully not super complex to integrate. Yeah, and then some interesting caveats that I'd like to mention. So although the sequencer determines the ordering and inclusion, it's still possible for the rollup nodes to uh, decide on a different ordering. Um, so we basically just apply a deterministic function to whatever the sequencer outputs. And then, um, yeah, the rollup nodes would just do that, and then they can reorder as long as it's deterministic. So that's kind of cool if you don't, yeah, if you want to like do a specific ordering um, in your rollup. And then another thing is that the sequencer itself is like completely agnostic to how the state root is committed on the rollup. So this is like basically optimistic or zk um, rollup proofs. So the sequencer does not care about that. It literally just like batches and the transactions. So yeah. Okay, so yeah, cross rollup composability. So yeah. Um, so since the sequencer is shared, um, it basically we can submit transactions for multiple rollups. So we could submit bundles of transactions um, containing transactions for different rollups to the sequencer. And then um, if we can get them to atomically execute, um, then you can do cross rollup MEV, cross rollup like swaps, like cross rollup whatever without, yeah, without making it. Yeah, basically you just can't do that right now. So, um, yeah, how this would work is that you just have your uh, bundle with multiple roll-up transactions in it, and then you send it, and then somehow it becomes atomically executed. Somehow. So, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so there's a problem with this. So, yeah, since uh, shared sequencers, decentralized sequencers right now have lazy execution due to the constraints I mentioned, we can't really guarantee atomic ex uh, execution. Um, you can only guarantee atomic inclusion at the sequencer level. So. Yeah, so say you have like your bundle, you can ensure that, um, assuming like the, the protocol allows for it, that you can um, have this bundle be atomically included, but it might not execute correctly on every um, rollup that it's destined for. So for example, like you do like a lock transaction on one rollup and then a mint on another for just like a basic bridging kind of example, um, you would not be able to guarantee that the lock was included. So the other rollup like probably doesn't want to mint if it can't guarantee that there was a lock on the other chain. So yeah, there could potentially be a way to fix this. So okay, so one method um, is that you ensure that your bundle ends up at the top of the block. So basically, so say you have your uh, transaction A and transaction B for two different rollups, and you want this to atomically execute. If you can uh, so you would basically simulate this beforehand and ensure that it executes off the current state. Um, and then if you place it at the top of the block without any transactions for either of those two rollups in front of it, then you can guarantee that it will atomically execute. Um, so that's kind of nice. But then, yeah, there's still kind of issues here in that, like, how does the rollup, like, know that it was, like, at the top of the block and that kind of thing? And also... Yeah, there's, there's issues, but <laughs> so essentially the bundler would just, you would have some sort of bundler, whatever it is, and then, uh, yeah, they have to go to the top of the block, and then, so yes, yeah, so then we can extend this and have uh, designated builders which run uh, different rollup nodes that can do the simulated execution. So, yeah, you don't have to, like, force either the users or the, um, the, the sequencer itself to do it. Yeah, and then the builders can ensure that, yeah, that they're automatically executed. And then, yeah, ignore them if not possible. So this is kind of similar to like, I don't know, flashbots models right now, just, yeah. They only get in if they can be automatically executed. Um, but yeah, I guess there's issues with this right now that I'm not gonna get into because I don't think I have enough time. But feel free to ask questions after.
Okay, so bridging. So how would bridging work with a shared sequencer? So say you're going from a sequencer to a rollup. This is like easy. So this is assuming like the sequencer chain has like its own token or whatever you want to use. Um, but then going to roll up to any other chain is harder, but not that hard. Um, so yeah, for sequencer to roll up. So yeah, assume you want to bridge, for example, like your sequencer token to the roll up. You would have your user submit a lock transaction to the sequencer. Sequencer publishes this. Um, the roll up full node will then the roll up full node also has to then become aware of like this transaction format and read it. Um, which is like, I don't know, it's okay if you want, yeah, but the roll-up node would have to like be able to identify this transaction, like add it to its state machine. Um, the roll-up full node would then, yeah, see this and then mint funds correspondingly. And that's basically it, so pretty easy. So then how do we go back? It gets a bit more complicated. So if we want to bridge from a uh, roll-up to another chain, then this is where like, the state root posting kind of comes in. Um, so yeah, so see so you have your user submit like a bridging transaction, uh, it gets sequenced, then there's a block with some state root that is created that contains this bridging transaction. Um, yeah, and then like the corresponding state change. So this is where you have like your optimistic or ZK proofs come in. So on our chain we want to bridge to, whether that's like sequencer, ETH, like whatever, just any chain, you would have like your rollup state root tracker that also can track uh, probably validation data from, or validator data from the sequencer chain as well to make sure that uh, the block was correctly um, committed by the sequencer. So yeah, you have this like rollup state root tracker, which is like maybe a contract or whatever. Um, your rollup full nodes, anyone could then post this state root after it's been executed um, to the contract. The contract would then, depending on whether it's like ZK or optimistic or whatever model you want to go with, um, if it's ZK, it would just post like the ZK proof to the contract, um, and then the state root's now in there. And then optimistic, like same thing. You do like you post it. If there's issues, do the fraud proof rounds. Either way, the state root ends up inside this contract and it is validated. So what would happen then is that the user can just prove that they did whatever action, um, bridge-wise. So yeah, it's not super complicated, as you can tell. It's basically not much more complicated how rollups already are. Yeah, so it's kind of nice. Um, yeah, I think that's basically it. So I think I have a bit of time for questions. Yeah, seven minutes. So cool, that is all. Um, yeah, if you want to check out my GitHub or Astria GitHub, there is. Uh, yeah, a bit of a uh, version of what I had mentioned in this talk. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, maybe you could uh, help me understand the following. So if we have this multi-role architecture, we have the um, sequencers, we have the roll-up nodes, we have potentially the bundles also. So how should we think about who actually determines whether a transaction will actually actually be included into the roll-up? I mean, sequencers may include it in the sequence, but then the roll-up technically can say, okay, I want to censor this tornado cache, OFAC, whatever, sanctioned address, and ultimately decide not to execute it, or, yeah, just your thoughts, what, uh, like, who actually determines the inclusion into the rollup? Right, yeah, so in that case, it would be the rollup node. Like, if you want to censor on your rollup level, you would have to basically change every rollup node to, like, like, not include this transaction. You'd have to, like, if it currently includes it, you'd have to, like, hard fork and, like, write in the code, like, do not execute anything from this address or something like that. Um, but yeah, that is not up to the sequencer. Um, but yeah, whether anyone wants to use a rollup like that is like a different question. I don't know, maybe people do, maybe they don't. So yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm curious, what kind of advantages shared sequencers bring over like uh, just submitting transaction directly to the A layer? For example, if we use Celestial or Aravail and we submit transactions there, um, yeah, why, why do, do we need shared sequencers at all? Are they complementary shared sequencers and these kind of DA chains or are they competing with each other? Yeah. 
Any yeah. thoughts on that? Thanks. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I guess the first thing that comes to mind is just that you can, you're not like bounded by the DA block time. So you could just have faster blocks, essentially, and faster commitments. Um, yeah, like I think the DA block times will probably be like on the order of like 12, 15 seconds, maybe more, maybe, but I think it's around there. So you could, with the shared sequencer, have like one second potentially block times and then have the, you would get your confirmation that it's been included in like some sequencer batch uh, like pretty quickly. Um, yeah, and then also you would have like the economic benefits of like the batching and uh, yeah, you probably like, the sequencer would be able to batch a bunch of transactions and like compress them and then post them to DA, which would be like, uh, cheaper than like submitting all of them directly. Yeah, especially for something like Celestia where you have like a minimum like blob size. So you have to like, I think it's like 500 bytes or something. So you would have to like pay for that whole data even if your transaction's not as big. But yeah, I guess that's like details. <laughs> but yeah, either way, yeah, those are the two main benefits, I think. For atomic execution, uh, I don't like, you know, the example that you gave is that you can only guarantee it I guess in a naive role of design, if you uh, include both the transactions at the start of the block, right, like at the very top, or whatever, at the top of the sequencer, sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, but for atomic execution, you don't care about the state root necessarily of the both rollups. You only care about the uh, storage of the stuff that the lock, you know, interacts with, right? Uh, so in theory, couldn't you have atomic execution as well, regardless of block position, uh, because the serious shared sequencer always knows the state of both chains, right? By using something like optional access lists, like how you have it in Geth for, you know, like pre-warming storage for, because of one of the previous uh, repricing, uh, gas repricing gas works, but you could use just something similar to say like, uh, you know, uh, include these transactions if and only if the set of states for Roll up A and roll up B are, like you know X Y Z. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but then you have the sequencer uh, has to be aware of the roll up state, which it is not right now, and you may not want it to be. But the yeah, but even if it's not like the oh right because the, the the roll ups doing execution are not aware of the other roll up. They're not. State, yeah. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right, any more questions on here? But expanding on the previous question, can you just do it optimistically? Like you include it even in not, not in the beginning of the block and then uh, if it, basically if it goes through, it goes through, right? If it doesn't, then, you know, it may be just up to the user to, uh, to retry. That means that there has to be some, co some, some coordinator kind of trying to send those transactions that are atomic and then maybe retry it again and so on. Um, yeah, I guess the issue there is more like if you're doing like something like lock and mint, you wouldn't, and you're like, say, the roll up that's minting, you wouldn't want to just like mint without having a lock done. So you would have to have your roll up, your roll ups would have to become like aware of the state of the other roll ups essentially, uh, which like roll up may or may not want. It gets, yeah, it gets janky, I guess. Like if you're trying to bridge through like a lot of things and you have to like embed a lot of other rollups like states into your rollup. Um, yeah, so I think there's probably nicer ways to do it, but yeah, definitely an area of research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? We have time for one. Nope. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.